Hi everyone, my name is Doug Kras and I want to welcome you to the Digital Overdose Conference 2. Today we're going to be talking about the adventures of IoT hacking. So first off, let's start out with who am I? I am a hacker, I'm a continual learner, and I'm a mega goober. I'm always trying to learn something new, whether it's hacking or additional skills that help me be a better pen tester. So what is IoT? Everyone talks about these IoT devices, so let's kind of define what they are. They could be a router, it could be a thermostat, a sensor, a smart fridge. Um, but where do you start if you want to start hacking on some of these devices? There's multiple ways to gain access to the devices, whether it's through hardware, through network services, or you can look at the firmware to find other possible paths of exploitation. So first, let's talk about some of these examples that we see all the time. We have temperature sensors, security cameras, washers, dryers, fridges, really anything that's online that's not a computer. And a lot of times these devices don't always have the best security. Maybe they don't get pen tested properly or the company just doesn't think they're worth pen testing because this requires a special skill set and IoT pen testers can be hard to come by. So why do we want to hack these devices? Well, typically they're less secure. They may not get security tested like we just talked about. It's a lot of fun. Um, you see a lot of really cool vulnerabilities and some weird issues. Um, and there's various attack surfaces. And once you learn the skill, you can make yourself more marketable because there are firms that are creating these devices that are looking for people with IoT skills. So let's talk about what kind of skills you might need for IoT pen testing. You should understand a basic level of electronics and how they function. Learning how to use a multimeter will greatly help your journey. Some devices are really nice and they label uh, different hardware protocols directly on the board. Um, otherwise, we can identify these protocols um, by looking at the processor models and then Googling out the pins and figuring out what pins do what on the device. Reverse engineering is a skill I use all the time. You don't necessarily need to be a crazy coder and, oh, I've had 20 years experience in this language or I can write seven different uh, various codes. You just need to be able to Google and kind of figure out what you think a function might do. When you open up different parts of the firmware, you can open them in tools like Hydra, which is a decompiler and it'll give you pseudo C code. When I started IoT pen testing, I had no knowledge of C code, but I can still look at it and find vulnerabilities. It's really just trying to figure out what the developer was thinking and how you could abuse the function in a way that they didn't expect. And then you should have some kind of soldering experience. It's pretty easy to get this experience, get a soldering iron, a fan to pull the fumes away, uh, some lead free solder, and then just get projects online. Like different badges are really easy to solder and it's a lot of fun. And finally, you just need a sense of adventure. So you need to be able to think about different ways to interact with the device and, oh, what happens if I do this? Create your theories and then go test out those theories. So what kind of attack surfaces do we have? Well, we have UART, JTAG, and SPY, which are some hardware protocols that we'll get into a little later. And then there's also usually network services on these devices, so HTTP, HTTPS servers, MQTT and MQTTS, which is a published subscribe network protocol. So you might subscribe to a temperature sensor reading and the device might push every five seconds. The temperature is this degree and this degree. And then your device might alert based on how um, that temperature changes. So if suddenly it's plus 30 degrees, you know, maybe your fridge is broken and you have some kind of issue. 
You can also look at how the firmware upgrade mechanisms can be attacked. So is the device hashing the firmware and checking it against a specific signature? Is it encrypting the firmware or does it just accept any firmware you give it? So you could make modifications to the firmware, zip it up, send it to the device and maybe backdoor the device. And then you also have the Bluetooth attack surface on some devices. You could maybe sniff Bluetooth traffic. You could sniff a firmware upgrade, maybe coming from like a mobile application to pushing the firmware on the device, changing device settings, various methods there. So let's talk about disassembling devices. You want to open them very carefully. It is very easy to snap some of the connector pins on like the outside of the case, which may not be super important if you're just hacking away at home. But when you're hacking enterprise devices, you want to be really careful. And if you were to you know, try to prove a point that you could send a malicious device into um, production, then you might want to not have a totally destroyed device. Always have the power disconnected when you're opening these devices, because at first you don't know how it functions, so you, there's a risk of being shocked there. And then you can look at the different components. So like on this board, we have this wind band chip, and you can Google that chip, and what it'll tell you is this is a RAM chip, so maybe not super interesting, but then if you looked uh, this Broadcom chip, you'll find out that's actually the processor. So you can figure out what hardware protocols you could interact with on the processor and how to potentially hack through some security protections put in place, or maybe there's no security protections and you can just hack right in. So how do we communicate with these devices? Well, we normally start out by using multimeter. What I use this for is to measure voltage and trace out pins. So maybe I know that there's a receive pin on the processor, but I want to know, does that go anywhere on the board? Because a lot of times there'll be pins on the board that you can just solder to instead of trying to solder to the processor, because that's really, really difficult and nothing that I've ever attempted. You also want a USB to serial adapter. So what this does is it lets you communicate over some of these protocols like UART, and you can pull up uh, a terminal in PuTTY and you can watch the device boot. And you can also get logic analyzers where you can view the signal coming across the different pins and then some of the software will try to decode that for you or you can kind of understand, okay, data travels on this line first, and then it goes to a different pin, and that can help you attack these devices as well. So let's talk about how you would go about maybe attacking some hardware. So you would connect to uh, UART, and you can watch the boot process. And this might tell you, okay, the firmware is loaded at these various memory addresses, and these are the different parts of the firmware. And maybe something happens that's interesting. Maybe you can interrupt it using something like just control C. Some things are more difficult. So the firmware is usually stored on a flash chip, but if you short that flash chip, the processor can't read the firmware from the flash. And a lot of times it'll fall into like a debug mode. Um, which is usually a UART shell or like a CFE shell, which is the common firmware emulator bootloader. So then once we're in the bootloader, we can modify how the device boots up. So typically it'll you know, load a couple different things, load some firmware into memory and then boot the firmware. But if at the end of that, you could modify to say, yeah, go ahead and boot the firmware and also just do init equals bin shell. So your initialize, um, variable starts a shell so it loads up your whole firmware then you get a shell when the device reboots and you win and then from there you can pull off firmware or do other various things so that you can discover more vulnerabilities so let's look at what a UART connection might let you do. We kind of covered it there, but you can see here 
that we can get, you know, the common firmware emulator version. So maybe there's some vulnerabilities here in this version where you can look and see, okay, we're loading this memory address here. This confirm contains the CFE memory. So maybe that's not super interesting, but the data might be interesting. Maybe the firmware's in there. And then you can see these pins here. Uh, a lot of times when you're looking for UART, there's a four pin setup and you can find the, all four pins on the board and then you could solder to those and connect them to your USB to serial connection. And then that lets you watch this boot up process. So what's some software that we need for IoT pen testing. I use Linux a lot, things like Screen, so you could watch that boot up process. Um, NM, bin walk. So NM lets you look at function tables and binaries, and then you can pull out certain keywords like exec or system calls that you can then use to go find dangerous functions and find vulnerabilities. Uh, use bin walk all the time. This is a great tool for extracting firmware, and it does it by identifying various magic bytes in a firmware image, and then it'll rip out those various parts, and it'll extract it all for you. Hopefully, at the end, you get a Linux file system or something so that you can further look at the device. Um, on Windows, you can use things like PuTTY or Ghidra for reverse engineering. A lot of people use Ida Pro, it's very expensive, so I use Ghidra. Uh, Windows subsystem for Linux as well, so you're not maybe jumping between virtual machines, but also use virtual machines to do things like your fuzz testing and other interactions with the device. So how do we interact with the... Uh, firmware and how do you kind of learn about firmware. Uh, you can go online, you can just download a lot of different firmware. So I recommend starting with the link below. There's a great blog post on this and you could download that same firmware, walk through the process that they followed to find their um, command injection and just download random firmware and it'll get you used to the reverse engineering, the extracting kind of the methodology. So you may not find a bunch of vulnerabilities in the firmware that you're reverse engineering or that specific binary, but you can start looking at some of that sudo C code and get used to, okay, this is what this looks like, and here's how I kind of build out my methodology for quickly finding vulnerabilities. So let's look at extracting the firmware. So we use Binwalk to extract the firmware. So go download some firmware on a vendor site. Um, if Binwalk's not installed, you can Google it and find out how to install it off of GitHub. And then once you extract the firmware, you're looking for something that looks kind of like a Linux file system. So if you look here, we have user var www root sbin. This looks like a file system to me. And once you get there, you can start extracting the firmware, uh, or you've already extracted the firmware at this point. So this is what extracting the firmware would look like. So Binwalk has gone ahead and pulled out some different magic bytes for things that it thinks are um, extractable from that firmware image. And then it'll tell you all this information. Eventually you'll get your Linux file system. So go through this, start looking for binaries that might be interesting. If you're doing IoT pen testing for like an organization, it would say start looking at binaries that you know that your developers wrote because yeah, you might find something in like an open source binary. So you could submit that to the package maintainers and say, hey, I found an issue, can you fix it? Um, but a lot of times, it's better just to focus on what your developers wrote because a lot of other people have looked at those binaries, so hopefully they're secure enough. So how do we go about finding some of these vulnerabilities? Well, you can do fuzz testing, so sending random, random data into services, so maybe a network socket or 
you know, you have a username and it's supposed to only be eight characters. Well, what if you sent nine or what if you sent 9,000 or what if the username's only uh, letters, but you send a bunch of symbols or a bunch of um, letters from a different language and it's supposed to be only accepting US language. Does it cause a crash? Does it overflow a buffer? What happens? So you just kind of start testing these theories and go, oh, okay this happens and you can automate a lot of this using various fuzzers so you don't have to sit there and oh i entered a hundred and nothing happened i 300 nothing happened i entered 500 days nothing happened um and then the whole reverse engineering part so look at your binaries see what's listening on network sockets is where i normally start because those are going to be remotely attackable those are higher vulnerabilities than something that you know you can only access once you have a shell on the device um, that's not as critical and then figure out kind of where your user inputs are and what happens so is there a login field what happens when you enter a username on the back end does that username get piped into some linux command can you escape out of that command and run your own command um, things to kind of look for and then test as you get into it so what are some vulnerabilities that we find in the field? Uh, we find a lot of remote code execution. Uh, there's a lot of buffer overflows where you say the username can only be eight characters. You put in nine so that um, the ninth character ends up in some other memory space. And then that can cause all sorts of issues um, from command injection to memory corruption and other things. There's also the malicious firmware update mechanisms so maybe i can just push a firmware with my backdoor binary in there and it just accepts it so it's not doing any kind of checking you can get access through the hardware leftover debug interfaces like the uarts and the jtag um, you could cause denial of service where you send a specific thing to the device like a string or something and it crashes the service or the whole device device reboots um, and then there's a lot of like, unencrypted communication so there's not good ssl and tls because managing certificates on devices can be hard um, and a lot of them just go over http anyway so let's look at going ahead and looking for command injection. So what we have here is we have the start of a C function. We're declaring some variables. We have this command that is going to be fit, uh, a max of 50 um, characters and it takes user bin cap. Now what we're doing here is we're putting in um, argument one which is going to be the user input. So when you run something like cat test.txt, argument one in that scenario would be test.txt. So argv1 is controlled. There is a system call here to the command. So we are going to be able to do command injection here. So let's look at the stir cat function that was used. Uh, you can just google this and it'll tell you all this information which is really nice about c it's all very well documented so we have a destination so this is a pointer to the destination array this will contain a c string the source is going to be string to be appended and then it returns a pointer to that string so at the end of this, we're going to point to somewhere in memory that is user bin cat and my attacker argument. So in this case, maybe it's test.txt if you are not being malicious. So we can add additional arguments to this. So what if we did cat test.txt semicolon? So now run a new command bin net cat listen on port quad sevens. Well, now we're running the second command and now we have a listener on the device. So we could go and connect directly to the device. We've broken out of the command and now we can access the system remotely. And a lot of people don't monitor IoT devices. 
So you may be able to put in your back door and nobody will ever find it. So let's look at some decompiled code here. This is off a blog post from Cisco Talos. I recommend reading any blogs that they put out. They're all fantastic. Um, and we're going to look at a cool example they found of command injection. So if you look up here, this is some of the sudo C code that was reverse engineered. And that basically what we have is this command. And we got this long command here, this WPA CLI command. And it does different things to kind of sanitize the command, get the variables that you want. Um, but then at the end, you have this SSID. And this SSID is a user controlled variable. So you're putting in like, hey, connect to my network. So your request to update this would be a post request because you're putting data on the device. In this case, it was an Ajax call. And you could put in some of the parameters, but then you put in a single quote, which this single quote escapes this single quote here. Then you put in a double quote, which escapes the double quote up here. Then that semicolon to say, hey, we've actually finished this WPA CLI command and go ahead and let's run and do one. And then in this case, it was just ran who am I? And the pound sign at the end is to comment out any additional code. So sometimes you don't break out at the end. So you want to comment the rest of it out so you don't end up breaking um, the device as you're doing this command or causing a crash or something because we want to keep attacking the device. So we can just Google that smprintf function. It'll tell us some things like it takes a character pointer to string, uh, size, format, etc. So format is going to be the C format. Size is the max number of bytes you could write. So if that was like five bytes, you'd have to get creative with your command. But if it's 200 bytes, you, know, you have a lot of room to play with. And so the percent %s field was injectable. So just break out of it with the semicolon, run our command, comment out the end so that it doesn't run additional code. So here we can run any command we want on Linux, assuming the binary is on that device, right? So if netcat is on there, we could get a reverse shell. If netcat's not on there, you can't. So you might do something like cat out the Etsy shadow file, assuming it's running as root, and then put that the contents of that into a directory that's accessible by the web server so we can view it later as the attacker, crack some passwords, things like that. Or you can just get really creative, right? Netcat's not on there, but Python is, or you know, various other methods. There's tons of different opportunities here. You basically are sitting on the device running commands. So get creative and you can definitely figure some fun things out. So how do we get started? Um, go out and buy an old router, right? These are not super expensive, 10, 20 bucks. Um, get a multimeter. Um, these aren't crazy expensive. They can range, I mean, from probably 30 bucks. You can probably find some, you know, for 500. You don't need the 500 for getting started. Um, and then a USB to TTY cable. This will let you communicate over that UART protocol, which is really nice. And then you just pull it up and putty. Get a soldering iron and some small cables. Look for like a decent soldering iron. I know I bought a really cheap one, and then after a year of use, the tip melted off, so that's not great. Um, and then go download firmware. If you don't get any of the other tools, you can just download the firmware and start reverse engineering, looking at the functions, looking for that command injection, um, buffer overflows, things like that. Just get used to kind of what decompiled sudo C code looks like. So how do we secure these devices? Well, we can encrypt the firmware. The, fir the companies can encrypt this on their site, so I can't just download it, reverse engineer it, and find vulnerabilities. Um, write secure code. Teach your developers what it's like to write bad code so that you know how, they know how to avoid it so that they don't put that into production. You can disable some of these hardware interfaces so that you can't get direct access to the firmware. 
um, through like the hardware method and then you encrypt your firmware on the sites, maybe it's harder for me to get access to that firmware as a hacker. Um, hack these devices before you put them into production. So you don't want to you know, just make IoT devices, throw them out there, and then somebody's coming out with a critical. Suddenly you have to figure out how to update it as a company and get all your clients updated. Uh, and you can do firmware signatures as well so that the device only trusts signed firmware. And that way I can't just backdoor firmware and put in my own stuff and move on, have access to the device. Some closing thoughts. So a wide variety of devices you can hack. Some of this knowledge can help you hack on cars, refrigerators, TVs, routers, uh, temperature sensors, you name it. There's a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, there's a lot of really fun findings that you can find as you reverse engineer a lot of this firmware. And finally, I want to say, go ahead and hack all the things. Hope you learned some good information from this talk, and I hope to see you hacking IoT devices.